Pat Wingrove, Cable Easel Program, uh, which is devoted to, the, to doing this uh, landscape painting uh, in a studio with a monitor and to fam take you to familiar places or places that you would like to see sometime. And you can see them through the eyes of me and through the eyes of maybe doing paintings of these places. Uh, behind me is, uh, is a high knob in the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, and I'm living down there now and taking the opportunity to paint these amazing scenes while I'm down there and bring them up and show you what there is beyond the shores of Long Island, uh, which, um, which I'm sure is, uh, is just as interesting to you as it is to me because we always like to know what there is beyond, beyond the horizon. And uh, we, you know, the, the composition of this, uh, of this um, painting called Setorkut Harbor uh, Park is uh, the nice curves that have taken place uh, almost in a natural form. Um, it's, it's a winter scene, obviously, the tide is out, and uh, the, um, the flotsam and jetsam, the ducks have come down here, there are reflections, there is a lovely muted tone to all of this, and so all the elements are there for a very, a very interesting and pretty piece. These curves that you see um, are something that uh, you really can't invent. If you don't, unless you see them, uh, you would not imagine that they would take place. So before, any, before I go any further, these lovely curves here that I just saw, I'm going to do the water, I'm going to lay, down, lay out the color of the water, which is uh, more than likely uh, as close to the color of the sky as you can get, because that's what it is. Water reflects the sky. In the wintertime, it t tends to be a little bit darker. Uh, I'm not sure why, I'm not going to question it, but I'm going to mix the color right on here, as I many times do because of, well, time constraints and the fact that you can cover a large area in a very short period of time. Not only does it accommodate the television program, but it also accommodates you if you're out there in the environment trying to get a great deal done before the light changes too fast. So with the addition of some cerulean blue, a touch of what the Grumbacher pe people call um, flesh tone. Uh, it's a kind of a wonderful smoky rose. It's got nothing to do with flesh tone, but it serves my purpose very well. And here I'm uh, putting it on uh, with the palette knife, a, a large plane of color to, get, to give you the, um, the background for the reflections, which is one of the, the reasons for this particular painting. The, the layout of the tree in the foreground is now disappearing underneath this color. And the palette knife is not going to uh, be used to leave all these uh, very uh, textured um, areas. It's going to be used merely to put the color on rapidly and then to smooth it out with a, uh, with a brush because this painting is going to be one of those smoothies. Uh, for the fact that the subject matter is uh, tiny reflections uh, and branches uh, that have no leaves anymore. So you, uh, the, the way that you can get that is with a, a delicate touch, a somewhat skillful touch. If you want to do this kind of thing, practice. Uh, you can't do anything without practicing. And the, uh, the, the practice that is needed is to handle delicate colors as well as delicate shapes in a delicate manner. Um, repetitious, but nevertheless may be effective because the Apparently, the quickest way to learn is to have repetition. And um, at the risk of boring you half out of your wits, I'm going to repeat it again. The delicacy with which you do winter scenes is vital uh, because it's a delicate time of year. Even though the weather is harsh and you freeze and shiver and you wish that it was over, it's still visually a very delicate time of year. Um, uh, I am, I'm intrigued with the, uh, with the quality of the, uh, 
of the landscape when it's uh, when it's this time of year and therefore I find that it's um it's quite wonderful to go out there and paint it well here is this wet paint it's sort of wet it's uh, it's Grumbacher's quick drying white and by the shoreline uh, there is a, a nondescript tone of darkness that is um that uh, that you can see perfectly clearly on your monitor in which right now you will see brave and um and uh, fortified ducks, ducks with uh, fortified against the cold with the, all that oil in their feathers, um, out there playing in very, very cold water. So, so much for um, the human uh, evaluation of what the cold does to you. The ducks have their own way of dealing with it. And so, as you can see, with the with the uh, and and you know it's in, it's interesting this little this little uh, space right here that I'm touching uh, dips down. It, this is an elevated little pond, and so uh, as the water, it, it's a sort of a miniature waterfall, and uh, so it, it 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 is dark here. There are some there are some um, uh, logs that are holding this water in into this little pond, but I want to prepare the um, the. Uh, delicate uh, condition of the water there's virtually no wind uh, what uh, what you see on the monitor there the surface of the water is doing that because of the activity of the ducks uh, they are they are um, mallards uh, male and female uh, i think that we uh, on the on the taping we got some close ups of these little fellows the uh, of course the mallards are very brightly colored with the, their their iridescent green necks and the uh, the ladies are far more demure and uh, and e less easy to find in the uh, in the winter landscape because they're sort of brown and spotted and um, you learn all these things when you bother to look at things carefully uh, that you may not see uh, too clearly at other times uh, so here is the uh, is the application of color over the quick drying uh, white which has been tinted to look a little bit um, less white than than real snow uh, because it's reflecting a gray sky and um there they are and uh, is that they are really extraordinary little guys out there uh, allowing uh, allowing anything to take place and uh, they they are apparently totally oblivious to it uh, naturally, we look at that in wonderment because we're not oblivious. We are very conscious of the temperature. If the temperature changes within five degrees, we either run to the thermostat or to the air conditioner. But not so with the ducks. They, uh, they manage to be able to, like all the wildlife out there, to um, take it as it comes. Um, uh, there are parts of this that are extremely dark. Uh, not extremely dark. They're sort of dark-ish. The um, the uh, the need to uh, be observant, I think, uh, is very nicely a great helped a great deal by the um, by the uh, the camcorder or the camcorder uh, in the in the comfort of your own environment. You can actually sit and study and, and replay and rewind and fast forward and backtrack and so on, in all the conditions that these are an, an opportunity that one of the painters of this area did not have uh, many many years ago the name man's name was William Sidney Mount and he is on exhibit permanent exhibit in the Stony Brook uh, museums uh, by all means uh, one of the great painters of all time an American uh, who lived in Setauket and Stony Brook for uh, all of his life except for a few little forays into New York City and he painted this area probably as well as anybody ever did and if you haven't gone on to see the paintings of William Sidney Mount by all means you really would find it uh, tremendously entertaining and rather surprising to be able to see some of the very familiar landscapes painted over a hundred years ago by Mr. Mount. Namely, not this particular park, because this is a brand new addition, but the harbor just beyond was, um, was painted by Mount in a very famous painting called Eel Spearing in Setauket. And uh, the descendant of the woman who is eel spearing uh, lives in Setauket right now, as of this day. Uh, she lives in Setauket. Her great, great, great granddaughter um, uh, is still living here. Um, uh, little pieces of information which may or may not um, mean anything to anybody's life, but it means a great deal, I think, to the people who are interested in this area because we do, after all, move to a place because of what it offers. And what it offers here is a throwback in time, many times, about what there was. Here are the reflections of these trees. 
Uh, they tend maybe to wiggle just a little bit because of the, the ducks uh, uh, um, causing water surface disturbances. But uh, I I if there's any way at all of being able to make this come across, you uh, you do it delicately, and there's nothing uh, there's nothing uh, really harsh about this. And as the uh, as the program progresses, you'll see that this these are reflected as well. These are come perfectly straight down, and they do wiggle. Uh, I'm using almost no color. I'm using a, a, a very thin brush, and I'm going to probably scumble that a little bit, but all of these trees have got a reflection right below them. Um, one of the reasons that I find uh, the uh, water paintings is uh, so intriguing because um, because there is a there is a genuine magic in this kind of in this kind of event. So, um, the uh, the need to uh, I'm going to let this paint set a little bit here uh, so that I can uh, work up some some more effects. But that's the general idea of how you would go about it. You can d disturb the surface of the water a little bit by running the brush across it. Uh, let me let me pull this let me pull this tree down rather far so that you can see. That I'll show you how, how you can uh, how, how I'm going to, going to give you the illusion that this is in fact um, a reflection. I'm going to go uh, get if if the uh, get here we got right close. I'm just going to pull the brush across that and, and give it the the, um, the look of, a, of the uh, the water surface being uh, being a little bit rippled. And uh, the paint is just sort of dry enough to be able to do that. And I think that the illusion, of course, is going to be that these are that these are uh, rippling with the surface. So uh, the, the there are other programs that show you uh, how to do all this uh, by uh, whacking the brush into um, and pulling paint down. It has to be deliberate, in my opinion. You have to make absolutely sure that what you're doing is logical and makes some sense and has some observation uh, with the lack of observation is the um, is the thing that I find tremendous fault with if you don't observe how can you possibly render and how can you possibly compare so uh, I've, been, I've been doing this for a very long time uh, 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 complaining as it were that there isn't enough instruction in some of the other programs they're just entertainment I'm hoping that my has my uh, program here has a little bit more um, concentration on the instruction at hand of how to do this and this is not not a mysterious event. It is an event that takes some patience and, above all, uh, above all else, some observation. I'll get to the ducks later as the as we wind up this program. This is part two, and um, hopefully I'm not going to be able to lose too much uh, with this jabbering. I, I need to uh, I need to get the the bank over here. Oh, let me see what is happening in the background. Oh, we've got some more of those wonderful, very pale, marshy. Uh, now turned yellow uh, uh, grasses that are um, that uh, any other time of year they are green, uh, brilliant green. At this time of year they're this really delicious ochre color uh, because they've all, they are, they're still growing, they're still firmly rooted in the ground or and in the mud, but they are um, they are ochre toned and. Um, I really kind of, I'm really kind of fond of them in this condition. They're they're awfully nice when they're green and have their great big cat and nine tails on the top. But right now they really sort of make a nice, uh, nice color scheme for this. The 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 bottom part of this clump of grass is darker because it's in shadow. It casts a certain shadow, and up against that, up against this darkness, then there's the opportunity to now put a nice swipe of fresh snow, uh, pure white. I'm going to take it right out of the tube. Which is here, and run some run some uh, some snow right up against this uh, this clump of of uh, grasses. Here we have uh, well, there it is. Uh, interpretation, of course, is a great deal of has a great deal to do with this kind of painting. You interpret, and you uh, you try to be accurate, but at the same time, you can get a um, a uh, painter's license to do a lot of interesting things with the. Um, with the uh, with the palette knife, so there's a mixture, a mixed media, going on here. Now, uh, before somebody starts to put fingers up in the air, telling me that I'm going to have to take a break, I'm going to put some. I'm going to put some uh, quick drying cobalt uh, mixture here and give you the grassy, a little bit more green. There happens to be some green in here, a uh, mixture of some uh, sap green and a little bit of this flesh tone uh, and um, yeah, the uh, the the. Uh, the little lawn part of this park uh, seems to have remained uh, green despite the freezing cold and the heavy snowfall. Some of it thawed when the um, when those thawing days took place, and so there is green in this picture. Probably the only thing in the picture that has got any color at all. And I'm laying on this background and running the green along this nice curve here because it's going to get an overlay of snow and an overlay of. Um, 
or maybe some uh, some well some grasses and things. So here is the here's that here's a little curve, and the uh, the darker part near the water is obviously some mud flats, and I'm putting those on with a brush, a sort of pure. This is. Uh, uh, a Van Dyke Brown right out of the tube to give you the uh, to give you the darkness, which is the drama of this whole thing, of the shoreline of this little pond, which uh, lies very demurely in its um, in its sleepy little place uh, in uh, in Setauket, East Setauket rather. Uh, no, no fanfare. There's no sign, no sign that tells you that this is the Setauket Harbor Park, but it is, and. Um, uh, uh, you may, you may, you may uh, feel, find it uh, rather, rather nice to just stop the car and look at it now in this condition. But then, uh, come the uh, in, in eighty some odd days when spring begins to return, you may want to uh, really m make a, uh, a little event of going and and and, and having a, a snack or something by this waterside. But for the for, for the time being, this is uh, pretty much the way the uh, the way the place looks, and this is pretty much how you are, how we all find it if you go by there within the next few days or so. Um, uh, if the snow falls again, this will now be not like this. There won't be any green visible. So, you know, with, uh, with that uh, remarkable statement uh, that there will be no green visible if the snow falls on it, um, I'm going to uh, just take a very short break, and I'll be right back. So hang on. Once again, I've just put in um, the little uh, the little shed here that is the Lion Brothers boat yard uh, where boats are stored, and all you see is the is the roof uh, the roof line and the um, and the the sort of the profile of the this side of the building. When you go by there and see this, you'll see this thing peeking out uh, from behind the bushes. Uh, in the summertime, it is an absolute beehive of activity because everybody in this area insists upon owning a boat, no matter how big or small, and um, many times you will find them just stored here all over the place. But right now it's uh, it's winter sleep time and everything here is fast asleep including the boatyard. Um, uh, the other thing that you might do when you're going down to look the, to check this place out is to find the uh, the boatyard down by the harbor which has got rows and rows and rows of sailboats all wrapped up in blue. Um, the uh, the apparently the color uh, the choice of color for plastic uh, to wrap up your boat is blue brilliant uh, turquoise blue and uh, there it is um, on every single boat it's quite a symphony of color here I'm going to uh, I'm going to begin to put in because the background is now is now set enough to be able to uh, to sketch in this uh, wonderful silhouetted darkness of this tree here. Um, the uh, these are the things that make you slam on the brakes in the car and say, okay, that's it. That's where that's where I want to go. Uh, that's going to do it. The shape of this tree has got its own shape. It isn't perfectly straight up in the air. It does some it does some weird things. I'm sure that it's been buffeted for a long time by winds and it's uh, it has assumed its branch growth. Um, and no tree is alike. So as I said a few moments ago, observation is the key to observe and to remember and to record. 
Uh, and if you can do that, you will find uh, not only is your painting going to improve, but also your ability to observe the things around you. I find that maybe we don't see enough. Um, I see it all the time because I'm plagued by it. But um, people who were introduced to painting in the way, in the manner in which I try to pull it off is, uh, is that you, uh, you discover wonderful things about uh, some things that you see every single day and all of a sudden they assume a different meaning. So with that, uh, with that uh, amount of uh, lecturing about what you ought to do with your lives, um, I'm going to continue uh, displaying to you the the uh, delicacy with which one one has to uh, this brush is now too full of paint I have to reduce the quantity of paint in this so to be able to get the thin quality that I want for this uh, small tree that's in silhouette way off here in this um, in, in the middle ground and it's uh, it is um, it's necessary to make the, these branches very much smaller than the ones of the of the other tree because the other tree is closer to you and it's just a suggestion you need just to get a bare suggestion of what you're looking at but there is a tree there that does a, does a nice thing it interrupts the distance, the distant landmass, and uh, that that little that, that's about all you need with that. And it's reflected directly below, uh, mysteriously enough, in a kind of very subtle way. Uh, thought, fortunately, the re the reflections are are one of my very favorite things, because they do give a three dimensional quality to just about everything. So. There is that guy. Where is the next one? Mm, yes, it's somewhere. Well, there's a great big one over here by the uh, by the um, the boathouse, and so that can go in. That's a real got a really fat trunk, and so let's put that really fat trunk in. This must be a real old job um, that has uh, that is nestled in here um, behind all of this activity. Do by all means um, uh, f find yourself interested enough in what I'm doing here to maybe pursue the uh, the business of, of, of checking out some of this stuff that we uh, that we have uh, we are so spoiled this is all at our fingertips we are able to have this uh, just with a just put the car in first gear a couple of gears later you find yourself in the presence of these these wonderful scenic places uh, just a little bit to, to the west of the place that, uh, that this little park is is a place called the Brewster house it was brought over here from Connecticut in the late 1600s if you can believe that it was uh, no late 1700s. Excuse me. It was it was built in Connecticut in the 1600s, and in the 1700s they put that thing on a barge and brought it across Long Island Sound and put it down in uh, in the on the piece of land directly adjacent to this. It's a wonderful old house, uh, preserved by the um, Melvilles uh, in the uh, in the manner in which they have been preserving around here for a very long period of time. And the Booster House is not to be entered, but you can see it from outside. And it's um, you know it's something to it's something to, to be conjured with. Uh, I'm going to be putting some of the uh, some of the um, snow on here now, rather thickly, out of the tube. This is the way I pull it out of the tube. I can take it right out of the tube on my palette knife. Um, squeeze it a little bit, pick it up from the palette knife. Don't even have to put it on the canvas anymore. And I'm going to lay it out so that some of it misses and some of it doesn't because the snow seems to be thawing a little bit. So a little bit of the missing is going to give you the effect that the snow is sort of thawing in places and maybe leaving little little um, dotty places uh, that are not quite gone yet. And all of this is the illusion of, re of, of realism. Um, uh, say what you will, it's, uh, it's all to be learned in the process. Um, I can talk endlessly to you about how to do it, but the best way is for you to watch me and possibly even try to uh, develop some of your own techniques but here's here's a little here's a little uh, little pieces of information that you may be interested in in finding out how I get these effects uh, the uh, everybody every painter has got their own their own uh, technique mine happens to be uh, a combination of uh, palette knife and uh, brushwork and more than anything else uh, very sharp uh, observation of the um, of the problem at hand. Here I find that the snow looks like it has gotten a little bit thicker and hasn't quite started to melt yet. So there's a mound of it here, uh, a little bit uh, a little bit more shaped than the other, not leaving so much. And you can hear as I'm pulling the uh, pulling the, the the knife. I'll stop talking. Maybe you can hear that. Yeah, you have to you have to be able to understand the. The, the physical uh, events that take place. This is uh, the event of pulling uh, paint across canvas makes a sound. And the more, the, the, the harder you dig into the canvas, the more sound it makes. 
when I'm painting in my studio, sometimes my husband says, ah, you're into some pretty energetic painting in there. I can hear your palette knife. So no secrets from anybody. So I'm going to continue by applying this, uh, this pure white on the canvas. You can't see it happening because the white is on white and obviously there is no seeing that happen. But I'm preparing the, uh, this um, area of snow in the foreground so that it can receive some of the shadowy substances that will tell you that uh, this is not just a white blanket of snow but there are places where it's, uh, it uh, dips and falls and rises and therefore casts shadows. And uh, those shadows are going to be slightly off-white uh, because they are shadows. And snow, uh, in certain times of day, has distinctly blue shadows, and other times of day it has distinctly purple shadows. So uh, observation, that's the, that's the key word. Uh, on a subtle painting such as this, the observation is vital. And I've, and I've mixed some of it. Let's see if it's uh, somewhat the right color. And it's, um, it, it, uh, it's applied in a very uh, loose, interpretive manner, hoping that maybe it will, it will in fact, um, tell the story. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the nice part about paintings, as opposed to f photographs, is that you're going to find yourself having to interpret the artist's viewpoint or the or the or the uh, the way the manner in which certain uh, ways of handling the paint are going to tell a story so here we have in the foreground all of this nice shadowy stuff and the last thing that i think is going to take place of course i'll refine some of the reflections in the water but this is this was meant to be purely a demonstration on how you go about this how do you go about doing this kind of thing uh, in a rather simplified form, if there's any more detail, um, the, uh, that would have to be done uh, in the uh, in time in the studio. I may probably refine this. Okay, having gotten the signal, the terrifying signal that the time is almost up, I'm going to show you that the way you would do the tree, and with the way I can do that is by reducing this to a little bit of more consistency by with the with the dryer. It's uh, it will and the tree comes, it grows here by the edge, and it's going to dissect or by, not dissect, bisect the, all the background that was put on and go clear up all the way to the top of the picture. This is what tells you that things are in uh, our nice depth feeling whereby this is in the foreground. It's going to have shadow on one side, it's going to have some light on the other, but here is the, here is the thing that tells you the um, the three-dimensional quality is what you're after in all of these in all of these um, uh, paintings. You see the shadow on this side of the tree tells you that it's a cylinder, albeit a very long, narrow one, but it is a cylinder, and it uh, it is got its dark side uh, on both sides. Interestingly enough, because the sun is not out, and what you're seeing is the uh, the darkness on two sides of this. Oh, Oh, it's not that way at all. This, the darkness is in the middle, and the lightness is on the outside. So we'll have to revise that. See, my, my observation was preconceived. Uh, and something that I'm telling everybody to avoid, do not get preconceived ideas. Just observe and follow what you see. So probably with, without, without enough time and without enough darkness in the background here, this pond has not become dark enough. So I would have to darken that considerably in order to get the light tones on either side of the tree, but the tree is there to tell you that that, that's, uh, that is the, oh, there's another one, another one, a bunch of wonderful trees over here, little gray fellows that are um, touch of black. Uh, the gray fellows over here, they are divided. This is a nice little, um, well, whatever this one is, I have no idea what this kind of tree is, but it, it's, it's, it's sitting here in the middle of this little snowbank, and it's uh, interrupting all sorts of things going on here, and it has a, a divided trunk. There it is, a divided trunk, uh, bisects the, uh, the, 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 the uh, building in the background, and it has its own little mound of dirt. Well, okay, the signal has come uh, that the time has run out, and of course that always happens, and the painting uh, is uh, as, as closely realized as it can be uh, with, the, with the time problem, but I think that you get the idea. And when I get this signal, that means wind it up, it's all over. I hope that um, I hope that you were interested enough to maybe go ahead and try and do one of these sometime. Uh, the only way you can find out if you're interested is to do it. In the meantime, I'm glad you watched. I hope you are. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.